Hey, uh, my name's Chris, one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you. And uh, today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. So if you've got your Bibles, would you open them up there? That's going to be our text this morning. We're going to camp out there. Now, today I want to talk to us. We're a church family, and uh, that's what the church is. It's a family of people who've been called into relationship with Jesus, uh, who've been called into a new set of relationships with one another. And this morning, what I want to talk to, about, talk to us about is, is how our, our relationship with Jesus um, starts to impact our relationships with one another. Um, Gavin and I talk about this in that we say, hey, um, we have the relationship in the vertical, but the, our vertical relationship with God, it starts to play itself out in our horizontal relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ, with the people that we love, trust, and do life with in the church. And so this morning, that's what Paul is going to press into uh, with our verses uh, that we're going to look at in just a moment. Before we jump into our verses, I kind of want to just pause because we're, we're towards the back end of Philippians. We're in the last chapter. I want to tell us, here's the context of where we're at. And I want to just remind us of where we're at in the story. So Paul was used by God when he was on a mission to plant the Philippian church. And uh, now Paul is no longer the pastor present, but he is imprisoned. And so the Philippian church sent some guys, Timothy and uh, I always love this guy's name, Epaphroditus, to uh, visit Paul while he's in prison. And of course they said, hey, Paul, here's what's going on in the church. I got to tell you, I gotta, we got to celebrate. You got to hear what's going on with the church. There's some good things. God's on the move. Here's what's happening. But it wasn't all good news. Paul learns from them in their report that there's conflict inside of the church among a couple leaders, that there's persecution, persecution happening that's pressing in from the outside of the church. And so there's lots to celebrate, but there's some drama happening in the church. So what you, you really have is this church in Philippi is wondering what's going to happen to our beloved church planter, Pastor Paul. He's in prison. Uh, he could be martyred or killed for his faith at any moment. They've got drama internally. They've got stressors pressing in externally. And so you've got this stressed out, anxious, unjoyful kind of church, and it's not a great place to be, okay? And Paul is going to be a good and loving pastor this morning, and he's going to press in and say, hey, church, don't forget the gospel, don't forget about what Jesus has done, and don't forget about how I've called you to live in relationship with one another. Don't, don't forget how we've been called to live amongst trials. And, and remember, we're being called to be a church that lives a certain way in light of what Christ has done for us. And so this morning, City Light, here's what I want. I don't want us to just read this book and study a church that existed 2,000 years ago. What I want us to do is to look at the story that played out here and to say, God, would you use these verses to press into our church and to say, hey, we want to live in light of the gospel. We want to be a church family that lives in a certain kind of way relationally that, that makes sense, that honors Jesus, that, that encourages one another. And so, God, would you use this text to encourage our church to live in light of what you've done and who you are? So City Light, this morning we're going to look at these verses with that perspective. These are not heady verses. These are not hyper-philosophical verses. This is good and practical coaching from Paul on what does it look like to be a church that lives in light of the gospel? How do we live in, uh, live in relationship with one another? And so if you have your bulletins, pull them out. Uh, I got four points this morning, a little fill in the blank, so you can go ahead and keep notes and write notes if that's your thing. If you're super type A and you'd love to come and you got 14 journals, please do that. That's God honoring and good, okay? So point one is unity. Point one is unity. The first thing I wanna talk about with marks of a gospel-centered church is it needs to be a uni unified church. And Paul is going to call this church to resolve their conflict. And what we're going to see in this text, in just, just a few seconds, verses 2 and 3, is that there's going to be two women who've got conflict with each other, and you'd say, okay, what's the big deal? Okay, this is nothing new. We've had people with conflict since the beginning of time. Chill out. Why is this such? Well, this is a big deal because the conflict isn't just this little interpersonal issue. What's happening is it's actually starting to divide the entire church. It started, people... This is what happens in organizations, this is what happens in churches, is that when there's a conflict between two people, um, all of a sudden, people start to take sides. And they don't necessarily, everybody else doesn't necessarily want to know just the facts of what happened to cause the conflict, but they just vote because somebody else is their friend, right? I like them more, so I'm taking their side of the story, and all of a sudden, this one little interpersonal conflict that happened between two people has the potential to change the culture of the entire church and make it incredibly unhealthy. And so Paul is going to press in and say, man, that's not the posture 
of Jesus' church. Jesus, in, in chapter 17 of John, prayed that his church would be like one, like the Father and Son are one. They would be that united. And so when Paul sees that that doesn't happen, he's going to press into that this morning. Let's read verses 2 and 3. I entreat Eudia and I entreat Syntyche. To, that was the hardest part of the whole sermon. Let me just everybody breathe right there. You, you think about saying Syntyche in front of a thousand people, okay? Agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true uh, companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So what we know about these two women who have conflict is that they're Christians. So their names are written in the book of life. That's a, that's a quote from Revelation. So we know that they are followers of Jesus. And we know that they've done ministry together at some point. Uh, the text says that they have labored side by side in ministry. And this is a big deal because Paul is borrowing imagery from a military setting where soldiers would stand side by side and they would fight the common enemy and they would stand unified in their posture and their position. Now, that's where they were at once at. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when you labor in ministry with people, you become really close. You high five, you celebrate, you talk about what God's doing. There's a real and natural bond that happens. Like if you've ever gone on a mission trip, you kind of get on a plane with 20 strangers and you come home and you're like, oh my gosh, I love you. We're family, Facebook me. You know, like all of a sudden you're besties. And that's where these women were once at. They were laboring in the gospel, pressing the ball forward, fighting the enemy of Satan and his evil thoughts in his life. And they're saying, King Jesus, I want to labor for you. And now... That love has been lost. At some point, they stopped standing side by side. They started squaring up, and now all of a sudden, they're in a civil war. They're fighting with their whole family. They're fighting the wrong enemy. Do you see how the perspective got lost here? Instead of moving outward, they're moving inward and fighting the wrong person. And so this is a big deal to Paul. And uh, we know it's a big deal by Paul because he starts dropping names, you guys. He's dropping names in a letter. Okay, this, this will give you a red flag that he's taking this real serious. He could have came and said, guys, you need to forgive one another in the Lord Jesus. Oh, no, he's calling folks out. And so um, you got to remember in this context, this letter, when it would have got delivered from Paul, everybody would have been very excited to hear from their beloved planter Paul. 11 years previous, he planted this church. He's been gone for four years. So to get an update from Paul was a very big deal. They gathered up, did church, somebody read the letter in its entirety, and they would have come to this section. Now, imagine you're in the room, and you're the, you're the woman with some conflict with your girlfriend. You walk in, it's a little tense, Paul's words are being read, and all of a sudden, Paul says, hey, um, you need to strain forward, forgetting what lies behind, and you're like, yes, let's move forward. Hey, your righteousness is in Christ. Absolutely. Amen. Preach, Paul. Julie and Samantha, listen up. Got a word for you. You know, all your friends are looking at you like, oh, no, he did it. You know, it's about to get serious. What's he going to say? You know, and he basically says, hey, I heard about the drama. Crush the drama, you know. Okay, you know, and that, that's what happened. He says, hey, listen, agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. So now all of a sudden, everybody in the church knows their assignment isn't to flirt with this idea. They got to crush the conflict ASAP, okay? And Paul, he doesn't just say, hey, as Christians, we just get over it and we play nice in the sandbox. He actually gives them some cool theological instructions here. He says, we agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. So his thrust is to say, hey, don't just, don't just brush over your conflict when he says agree in the Lord. What he's doing is he's reminding them of the family of God's unity theologically. Listen, what brings us together, why we have unity as a church, isn't our political status. It's because we, we love Jesus Christ. He's our one hope. He's our one savior. His, his Holy Spirit fills me and he fills you. We've got a common mission in Jesus to make disciples. We've got a common hope that death is not the end, that we'll be resurrected. So we have all of this unity in King Jesus. That's the thing that unites us. And he's saying, don't settle, church, for just theological unity. You've got to pursue relational unity. It's hypocritical for us to say lip service like I'm, oh, we are just one in Christ. I hate my sister. See the disconnect there? He's saying that should not be the posture of God's people. This is a clear call for them to crush the drama. So what's interesting here is these are two women that are godly. They've labored in ministry. They're the real deal, okay? And so what was encouraging to me is to realize 
Even as a church, if we labor together, we might have conflict. That's to be expected. But Paul is modeling to us and showing us, is, isn't just that a healthy church is perfect and they don't have conflict. A healthy church has conflict, but they resolve their conflict. Amen? We press in for the good of others and the glory of Christ Jesus and the witness that we have in our city to actually pursue relational unity. And so let me press this in. If you're part of a city group, you know somebody in this church, you, you, you might be hanging out with your city group. And guess what? Have you ever been in a city group and realized that you don't love everybody in that city group? Nobody else. Wow. You guys have never been in Christian community before. Anyways, <laughs> you know what? That happens. You, you don't always naturally hit it off. And sometimes because we're self-centered, we actually hurt people in word and deed. Okay. We sin against one another. And here's what your options are going to be in that moment. You can bounce out of your city group, try to find a different city group and find just as many jacked up people and be surprised and then bounce out to another city group and try to find a different group of people. Okay. Or you can just kind of stay in that city group and everybody in the room knows that you don't like each other and that there's conflict and that there's drama and it's petty and it's uncomfortable when you two are in the same room. You can ruin the whole atmosphere of this thing. Or he says you can stay in community and actually try to pursue relational unity by agreeing in the Lord and saying, listen, I'm not here to win the argument. Let's actually have a conversation in light of the gospel. Amen. That is good and God honoring. That is a win that glorifies King Jesus. That blesses the church. It blesses your community when two people humble themselves and actually work it out. Now, Paul is going to say, this is such a big deal. Look at verse three. Look at verse three. He's going to, um, he's going to say, true companion, help these women. So what he's saying there is bring in a mediator. Nobody knows who this true companion is. I couldn't find it, read some verses, couldn't figure out who he was talking about, but the people in that local context knew who he was referring to. And so he's saying there needs to be a mediator because these women, they might have tried to work this stuff out on their own and instead of it getting calmed down, it escalated. Have you ever had that? I'm gonna work this out with my friend. You walk away from the conversation more angry than you've ever been, you know? And and you can get stuck in this cycle of, I'm angry, I'm digging in my heels, I'm going to be stubborn. And so what Paul does is he says, hey, sometimes Christians, you need a mediator. You're not going to be able to work it out on your own. You got, hey, whoever this true companion is, you're a mature, godly person. Help these two ladies work this thing out. And let me talk to you from personal experience. I've been in that place where I just said, hey, I got conflict. I need a mediator. Okay? Um, when we planted this church, it was stressful, crazy. My wife was a new mom, staying at home. That was a total change for her. I was planting a church, all insecure about what this thing would be. And we, in our home life, man, it was, it was we were just butting heads. And I've talked about this, and we, we just, the more I went home and just said, hey, we need to work this out, and here's my thoughts, and here's my position, and here's my take on what's happening. It was like, rah, you know, I'm like, I'm like oh, no, you didn't, you know. So it's just like, we're getting here, you know, and you're like going home, you're going to work the next day, like, I don't feel like that went well, you know? And so, <laughs> pans are getting thrown. No, I'm joking. Uh, so I just said, hey, I'm tapping out. Hey, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. I need help, okay? It was humbling to pick up the phone and call a counselor and say, hey, I need a mediator. I need some help, you know? We, we need to get on the same page. And it was humbling, but it was worth it. You walk into my home now, we are united side by side. My wife and I are united that we are laboring in gospel ministry. Our kids, our house is not divided. They're not growing up insecure, not in this uneasy culture where mom and dad just coexist, but they don't like each other and love each other. Man, there is a, a unity that we have relationally and theologically that is strong. It has changed the culture of our home. And it was absolutely humbling to pick up the phone and say, hey, I need a mediator, but it was worth it. And church, for some of you guys in this room, I want to press this in. You're in that place where you've got resentment and bitterness and stuff going on in relationships with people in your life. And I don't know if it's your coworkers or your wife or your spouse or your kids or your in-laws or whoever it is. And I'm just saying, God will get the most glory when you work that out. When you humble yourself and say, hey, because of the gospel, I want to love you. I want to learn from you. I want to expose my sin. I wanna, I'm quick to say I'm sorry. I don't have to win here. Let's just pursue relational unity. Is that a win? City Light, the first sign of a gospel-centered church is unity. The second thing I want to press into is joy. Paul is going to call this church to rejoice in everything. Let me ask you, is rejoicing your natural default mode? Like when you get a flat tire, is your first thought like, you know what? This is God showing me. I just need to pull over and spend some time rejoicing with him. <laughs> or are you like, oh, no, he didn't. No, no. Who put the, 
Who put the trash can in the middle of the road? Who put the nail? I mean, you just go off and you're angry and you're bitter. It's because what's natural to our posture is not rejoicing, but the opposite of that, which is complaining. And if you've ever read the Old Testament, the people of God, like they were freed from slavery and all of a sudden they're angry that they don't have enough steak to eat in the desert, okay? And so we do this still to the day. Now we're in Nebraska, the weather changes. Guess what I hear all winter? It is so cold and gray, I need to move to Arizona, okay? It's just too much. It's too much for me. And then guess what I hear in the summer? It is so hot. My AC in my car is not working. I'm miserable. I can't do it. I just literally cannot do it. You're like, you just told me a few months ago it's too, too cold. Now it's too hot, right? This happens financially. You know, we can complain about money all the time. This is what I hear. This is what I do too. Oh my goodness, I got a raise. Yay. Taxes. Oh my gosh, the taxes. So much for the taxes. What do they do with the taxes? Right? You just look at the number they take. You don't look at what you get. And then all of a sudden, you don't make that much. I've been there. I'm like, man, I don't make no money. Do I rejoice because I'm not paying taxes? No. I, I'm angry. I'm still angry. I'm like, dude, how do I get to that next level? You know, so I'm complaining either way. Married people, we married and singles, we do this. Okay, you walk in the house when you're married around Christmas time. I've talked to you guys about my pain. Sports are on, college football's on, it's playoff time, all these things. What's on my TV? Some kind of cooking show from a woman at a ranch? I don't know. Some lady, rancher cook, I don't know. It's like 14 different casseroles in an hour. I have no idea. I'm just angry that we're not watching sports, you know? Singles are like, but that sounds so nice. I just wish I had somebody to watch my cooking shows with. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, you don't know the struggle, player, okay? You're watching 14 consecutive hours of Netflix alone, uninterrupted? Come on. <laughs> struggle is not that real, okay? So, <laughs> so hard. Um, it's uh, so funny, man. Nobody's ever happy with this stuff, and so, <laughs> Paul is saying, let's not let that be our posture. Let's rejoice in the Lord, okay? Let's rejoice. And he says it in verse four. Let's read it real quick together. Let's read it real quick. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, in chapter one, he said, I will rejoice. Chapter three, verse one, he said, rejoice in the Lord. In chapter four, verse four, he says, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice. He says it twice. Why? He doesn't want you to miss it. He's using repetition because he's saying, don't miss this. Actually spend time rejoicing in the Lord. And we got to remember the context here. Paul is not sitting beachside at some resort eating fish tacos, talking about, I'm just so happy in the Lord right now. He's in jail alone. That's his context. That's his context. And he's saying, would we be a people that rejoice? There is this unshakable joy and gladness in his posture, in his life, and in his words Maybe the most interesting thing here he says is rejoice in the Lord always. Now, first part of that, rejoice in the Lord. Christians, we don't rejoice in our circumstances. We rejoice in who Jesus Christ is. Some of you guys are like, rejoice, really? My Wi-Fi is running slow. Yeah, rejoice. But we rejoice not in our circumstances. We rejoice in the gospel. If you understand the fullness of the gospel, then you understand that regardless of your circumstances, even on your worst day, you have a reason to rejoice. And you're like, really? Let me tell you why. If you understand that you were headed towards eternal separation from God, and Jesus came and pursued you and rescued you and gave you an entirely new eternal life and inheritance, if you understand that you've been adopted by the Heavenly Father into a relationship with Him and into this redeemed family, if you understand that He gave you his Holy Spirit to comfort you and lead you and speak to you in the here and the now and to give you power and victory on this side of eternity? Man, like when you understand all that is yours, when you understand the promise that God made to you, that I will never leave you nor forsake you, do we need to keep going? When you understand the fullness of the gospel, the Christian's posture isn't one of complaining that my boss is too dramatic. The Christian's posture is grateful for what Jesus Christ has done. That's our posture as a church. We celebrate and we, and we get excited about who Jesus is and what he's done. So we rejoice not in our circumstances, but we rejoice in who Christ is. And it just says always. And so this is our continual posture. And some of you guys are going to find yourself in hard, messy situations. And I just want to preach this into you because I don't know where you're at. But one of the things that I love about the Bible is he says you can rejoice even when you're in a trial. Because James chapter 1 says, hey, God knew you'd be there. He's sovereign, and he's going to use that trial 
for your good. Because there's stuff that God can do when things are messy that he can't do in your life when stuff is easy. He loves to use pain. He doesn't always use prosperity. That's our God. But he loves you enough to let you go through those things. So even when you're in those things, you can say, God, I know that you love me enough to change me and shape me and refine me. And if this is the way that you're going to do it, that's okay. Amen? So that's our joy. We rejoice in the Lord and we rejoice always. And City Light, um, this isn't just a personal appeal to you on a personal level. Yes, I want to challenge you. Take inventory of your life. Are you primarily complaining your way through life, grumbling against God and your circumstances? Oh my goodness, I'm just so busy, you know? Or are you actually grateful for what God's done? But the corporate challenge here is one of the ways that we live this out at City Light is we, don't, we actually sing and rejoice together. And when we worship Jesus after the sermon, this is not just what we do to engage musicians and feel emotional. This is the way that we express and declare together, God, you are good. Father, you are good. And you are worthy to be praised. And we rejoice in what you've done and who you are. And so challenge at City Light is some of you guys, like we come up here to sing. You come in, post it up arms folded, face unengaged. You're just like, dude, did you have coffee? They got it in the back. Like, why are you so angry? I don't understand. You know, it's like we just talked about what Christ has done and there's no affection in your body. And I'm not just saying everybody's got to go here. That's me, okay? But you could at least do something with your face. Do anything <laughs> with your face, okay? Try to even lip sing. I don't even know. Just do, can, you, can we rejoice in Jesus Christ and what he's done? Amen, church? Let's do that. That's okay. Thank you. You can clap for that. I want to challenge us for that. Now, all right, point three is peace. Point three is peace. Now, Paul is going to talk to us about a peace that we can have in God that we can't have anywhere else. And the opposite of peace, the peace is it is well in my soul. We just, we just sung it. That's the posture of the Christian. That's the posture of God. He is at peace. He's not stressed. He's not anxious. He is at peace. And the opposite of peace is anxiety. And he talks about that. And um, anxiety is when we stress out about all of the future situations that could happen, okay? So you look into the future, and all of a sudden you want to freak out about everything that may happen. And City Light, here's what I know. I'm anxious. You're anxious. We are a, a, a nation of anxious people. You know, 40 million people. You can Google it. First thing that comes up, 40 million people in our country right now are diagnosed with anxiety. 40 million. Largest mental health issue in the entire country. 40 million people are on medication for anxiety. It's that severe. We got more people with more food and more money and more anxiety. Explain that to me. How does that happen? That's our country. That's where we're at. And for most of us, anxiety happens by looking into the future, realizing there's a whole bunch of stuff that could happen and then freaking out about it, okay? And so here's what anxiety sounds like. What if Donald Trump gets elected? What if Hillary gets elected? Oh my goodness, what is going to happen to our nation? Okay, what if I lose my job, the economy crashes, and I go broke, and I got to live in my parents' basement? That's horrible. What if? What if I get promoted and all my friends at work resent me because I was the first one up the ladder? What if nobody ever wants to marry me? What if I get married and it's horrible? What if I have kids? And they're super socially awkward, and nobody ever invites them to prom, and they just live in my basement and play with cats. What if? <laughs> what if I have kids, and they're the cool kids, and the fun athletes, and they're the partiers, and they just play beer pong, and dance on tables, and go crazy, and then they ruin their lives, and then I get a call at four in the morning, Dad, I'm in jail. What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if I make no money in my life, and I don't have enough money to retire? What if? Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What if, what if I stress out my whole life, save all my money, grind, live below my means, and then I die at 45? What if? What if? It's a lose-lose. What if, what if, what if? You see how horrible this is? Oh my goodness, City Light. I have struggled with anxiety. My stress used to be, what if this thing called City Light never gets off the ground? What if nobody shows up? What if I got to tell my wife I'm selling Kias and Council Bluff? What if, what if, what if? And then God showed up. A thousand of you keep showing up. And then I'm like, oh my goodness. What if they finally realize I don't know what I'm doing? Okay. What if? What if they said, hey, it was a good run, buddy, but step aside. You know what I mean? What if? What if, what if, what if? Okay. Now, don't do that, okay? I got to feed my family too, so don't hate on a player, okay? Now, listen. Okay, this is dumb. 
We play the what if. Now let's read because Paul says there's a different way for us to live our lives. Verse 5 through 7. Let me read. He says, let your reasonable be known to everyone. The Lord, look at this promise, y'all. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what we need to know. Anxiety, anxiety is in our lives. And we have to ask ourselves, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. And you go, really? Nothing. Don't stress out about anything. Let me tell you about anxiety. It's not cute. It is damaging. It hurts you physically. It wears you out emotionally. And it strips you down spiritually. You cannot experience the peace of God if you are sitting in anxiety. And some of you think anxiety is just an okay response to an overwhelming circumstance in your life. But let me tell you, the Bible calls anxiety sin. And if anxiety is sin, it's not good for you, it's not helpful for others, and it's not God-honoring. And if anxiety is sin, it shouldn't be managed, it should be repented from. It's not cute. Don't tolerate it. Declare war on it. Now, how do we move from people who are anxious to people who are experiencing the peace of God? That's the question in this text. How do we do that? Well, here it is. Verse 5, I showed you, underline that, circle it says the Lord is at hand. First promise scripture gives you is you got to remember when you're anxious, you're staring at a big wave that's about to crash in your life and you're intimidated by your circumstances. Sometimes the only peace that you have is that the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And you might say, why is that good news? Well, because the Lord loves you. He created the heavens and the earth. He is all powerful. He is all knowing and he is near to you. You can experience his presence and his power in your life. So when you're in something that looks chaotic and crazy, you have to make a choice. Am I going to try to do this alone or am I going to trust that the Lord is at hand? That's sometimes all you got, okay? Second thing he's going to say is there's a peace of God that he wants to give you. He wants to allow you to experience that. But his primary means to, for you to experience the peace of God and to move out of your anxiety is prayer. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but what? Pray about everything. You know, I think we flip the script. I think we stress out about everything and pray about nothing, <laughs> And that's a horrible recipe for life. He's saying, let me know how that's working out for you, right? And, and so Paul is going to say, if you want to experience the peace of God, then you need to press in to the heavenly father. And here's what prayer is. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. It's an honor that we get to pray and do life with, with our eternal father. And so it, some of you guys grew up in religious settings. It was very formal. You always felt like if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to get in trouble. But that... Listen, prayer is a conversation. It's a dialogue. It's relation, relational. And here's why prayer is so freeing. When you pray, you remind your heart and your soul, I'm not the leader of my life. King Jesus is the leader of my life. I, I'm the child and he's the father. I, there's some stuff in my life that I need you to work out, for you to provide, for you to do. And you surrender it at the father's feet instead of trying to carry it on your own. That's the posture of prayer. Is it humbling? Yes. There's no pride in prayer. You're not awesome in prayer. You sit at the Father's feet. You crawl up in his lap and you say, Daddy, here's what's really going on. Don't be embarrassed by it. He already knows what you're anxious about. And I love that he says, be prayerful in everything. So sometimes you guys are like, it's not that big of a deal. You minimize it. Well, you're stressed out about it, so you should probably talk to him about it. And sometimes it's a really big deal. And you say, would you talk to the Father about it? So in everything, would we be people who pray and remember that the Lord is near. So now let me press this in. Some of you guys have been anxious about your kids. You're anxious about your money situation. You're anxious about your career. You're anxious about a million things. And I just want to say the invitation for scripture, the good news is from scripture is you don't have to live in chronic anxiety. Do you understand that? That God wants to give you a peace in the here and the now and allow you to experience what will be yours finally and forever in eternity. You'll get a little glimpse of that right now. Is that amazing? But so, church, I just want to say, would we actually do this? Like, legitimately pause this week when you find yourself going down that same trial, uh, trail that leads to anxiety and say, no, I need to pause and you need to do business with God this week. Amen? Yeah. We pray about it. Pray. Amen? Pray. It's okay. Peace. It's all right. It's not that crazy. Got to stop medicating anxiety. We actually got to pray and do business with our Father. That's where we find peace. All right. 
Last point, new thinking and doing. New thinking and doing. Verse, uh, last point, new thinking and doing. Put into practice what you know. Paul basically is going to say two things at the very end. Verse 8 and 9. I'll read them in just a second. But here's what he's going to say. When you experience Jesus, there's a change in your mindset. Now, how many of you guys know this? When you come to know Christ, you find yourself thinking about stuff that you never thought you would think about. Now, all of a sudden, you're talking about eternity. You're seeing the trees differently. You're looking at your friends differently. You're looking at your sister in Christ differently. All of a sudden, God gives you a new mindset. It's called the mind of Christ, and things just change. He's going to say, not only are you going to change your mindset when you come to know Christ, but that mindset is going to work itself out in practical ways. It's going to change, really, every area of your actions and attitudes. And so there needs to be new thinking and new doing. Let me read uh, verse 8 and 9. He says, finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Look at this. Circle this. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What a beautiful promise. The God of peace will be with you. So he starts this in verse 8. He says, you need to understand the battle for your life starts in your mind. How you choose, you choose, how you choose to think about people, relationships, stuff in your life is going to impact how you feel about them. And how you feel about them and how you think about them is going to impact how you interact with those things. So if you're married, if, you, if all you're doing is thinking critical thoughts about your husband or your wife, that's going to affect the way you feel towards them. It's going to affect the way that you interact with them in the home. You're not going to show honor, love, and respect if you're cultivating disrespectful thoughts in your mind. I mean, the battle starts in your mind. If, if you look at your coworkers and all you're doing is being judgmental towards your neighbors, and co- it's going to affect the way you feel. It's going to affect the way that you interact with them. He said, do you guys understand? Christian, you actually have a choice to cultivate the mind of Christ. Just like you have a choice to pick up your Bible and read the Word of God and then not click on a website. You have a choice to not let your mind take you into ungodly places. You can take every thought cra- captive by the glo- to the glory of Christ Jesus. And so the battle for your life starts right here, okay? How you think, what you dwell on. And so the, the challenge here is, he says, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, would you think about Christ, the most excellent and praiseworthy thing? Would you think about his word? Would you think about his beauty? Would you think about his goodness? Would you cultivate that? Would you think about his truth and see things in light of that? And then last thing, he says in verse 9, he says, you've seen me do some things. You've learned some things from me. I've modeled some things to you. If you've received anything from me, look at that thrust. He says in verse 9, put them into practice. So basically, he doesn't want to be the teacher where you just memorize some stuff, but you never actually do anything with your life. The Christian life is not a passive thing. It has to get played out in every arena of our life. And so he's saying, don't just think about praying this week. Hey, what if you actually prayed? Ah, crazy. Don't just think about being a good steward and giving generously. You know how the gospel impacts that area of your life. Put it into practice. Don't just think about resolving the conflict with your sister or your brother. Hey, you can actually do it this week. So the Christian life is not one of intentions. It's one of intentionality and action. So would we be those people? Church, hey, let me close it down here. I want to end with this. I want you guys to know that Jesus Christ is the God of peace. Do you guys know? There's a lot said about peace. Do you know that our ultimate peace with our heavenly father came because Jesus Christ went through something very unpeaceful? He hung on a cross so that we could have peace with God, and Jesus loves you enough that he wants you to experience his present peace right here and right now. Church, would this week we not look at this text and say, wow, that's some really neat stuff for a church family to do. But this week, if you've interacted with God and you've heard from the Holy Spirit, would you actually move from anxiety to peace? Would you pray and do life with your father? Hey, if you've got conflict, would you actually pick up the phone and go to coffee and talk it out with somebody? Would we actually be a people that allows the the word of God to change our thinking and our doing? Let me pray. God, I want to say thank you that you gave me peace with you. That years ago when I was an enemy of yours and when we were enemies of yours, when we were running from you and rebelling uh, from you, God, you came after us and you gave us peace with you, Father. We are right with you because of your finished work on the cross. And so, Jesus, I thank you for that peace. And I want to pray for our church right here, right now. Would we live in light of what you've done? Would we forgive others freely because you've forgiven us? Would we pursue unity? Because, God, you pursued the ultimate unity between God and man. 
Lord Jesus, would you help us to live in light of this text, and would we be a people mindful of your truths and obedience to your scriptures? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.